Time magazine says that Martin Luther King Jr. has made himself the unchallenged voice of the Negro people, that his voice has infused the Negroes with the fiber that gives their revolution its true stature, that he has become to millions in the North and in the South the symbol of the Negro revolution. And for these and other reasons, Time magazine selected him as the man of the year. He is a member of the clergy. He has been called the American Gandhi. His sermons have been published in book form under the titles Stride Toward Freedom and Strength to Love. He is with us today from Atlanta, Georgia, where he is president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We'll have a question now from Gay Pauley. Dr. King, you were quoted in mid-November of last year before the assassination of President Kennedy as saying that you would not support a presidential candidate in 1964. Uh, will you back President Johnson in this year's campaign? I think I will still follow the policy in 1964 of not supporting any presidential candidate. Uh, naturally, I will have my private convictions and I will vote as anyone else. Uh, but I will not uh, come out with a public endorsement for a candidate of either party. Well, would you tell us your private convictions then? Well, I don't know at this time. I would have to notice the turn of events. Uh, I don't know who the Republican nominee will be. It is probable that Mr. Johnson will be the Democratic nominee. Mm -hmm but uh, we don't know the Republican nominee, and I would have to see these turn of events before making any decision. Don't, don't you think, uh, Dr. King, and on the basis of uh, the fact that civil rights is going to be one of the big issues in the political campaign, that perhaps a stand is necessary on the part of, of civil rights leaders such as you? How can you back off from that when you, um, when you uh, swung the vote for Mr. Kennedy, for example, in 1960, the Negro vote? Well, that was a different situation. Actually, I did not uh, publicly uh, endorse Mr. Kennedy, even though I had certain private convictions there. I happened to head a nonpartisan organization, and this is one of the problems. Uh, when you head a nonpartisan uh, partisan organization with a policy of not endorsing candidates, then you are in the position of not being able to on the basis of the policy of the organization. Also, I think some leaders must keep themselves in the position of being able to look objectively at both political parties and not uh, become inextricably bound to either. Well, you mentioned uh, Republicans um, and the Republican side and the Negro vote. Uh, who do you think the Negro uh, voter will accept for the GOP uh, presidential nomination? Whom do you think they will support? Well, there are several. Uh, who have, I mean, who Would have you been name mentioned them? Would you, um... that uh, may uh, be able to get support from the Negro community. Certainly would you some name Negro some, sir, that pro well, perhaps Mr. would have Rockefeller, better chances? Rockefeller. Uh, would certainly be able to uh, influence uh, some Negro voters. I don't know the percentage, but mm -hmm. certainly he has taken a strong position on civil rights. And I think the average Negro voter would recognize What this. about uh, Senator uh, Barry Goldwater now and his strength in the South with the Negro vote? Well, he's made his position very clear on civil rights, and that is uh, leave it to the states, which means leave it to Mr. Wallace in Alabama mm -hmm. and others uh, across the South. Consequently, I don't think uh, the vast majority of Negroes in the country uh, would respond positively to Mr. Goldwater. I think it would be the other way. I think most of them would reject uh, him for that reason. Catherine Mackin. Dr. King, recently you were quoted as saying that uh, the Negro people can expect more from Pres President Johnson than the Negro people have had up to now. Exactly what do you mean when you say they can expect more? More of what? Well, there may have been a misinterpretation there. Uh, I do feel that uh, President Johnson is committed on the question of civil rights in general and civil rights legislation in particular. And uh, I think his long legislative experience, his experience with uh, Congress as Senate Majority Leader, will give him an entree and a sort of a power of communication with the Senate uh, that others in the past may not have had. And the fact that he is a Southerner uh, may work in his favor in dealing with uh, recalcitrant Southern 
congressman. So in this sense, I do think he will press on in a very significant way in trying to make civil rights a reality. Well, then actually, he's not really giving you any more than any other president uh, in the position that a president in, is in today regarding civil rights would actually do or have to do. Yes. Well, no, I, I don't uh, think, I, I didn't make a statement that he would give more. I think President Kennedy uh, was a very strong president in civil rights, and uh, he was the one who brought forth this very comprehensive civil rights package so that Mr. Johnson will be carrying out uh, what was recommended by the late President Kennedy, and I think he will do that. Mm -hmm. And my statement was that uh, he may be able to get it through sooner than the late President Kennedy could have gotten this legislation through. Uh, Dr. King, mentioning the Civil Rights Bill, there were a lot of Republicans on Capitol Hill who uh, were a little upset at the type of coverage and, if I can use the word thanks, they were getting from uh, civil rights groups for what they had done for their part in uh, shepherding this bill through the Congress or through the, it's not through yet, but through the House Judiciary Committee and actually drawing up the bill. Uh, what do you think about the Republican role in this? Well, I think it is absolutely necessary to have Republican support to get the bill through. It has to be bipartisan support. And uh, I do think there have been some Republican congressmen who have played significant roles in getting the legislation through. And I would hope that the same thing will take place in the Senate, because this will be needed in order to get it through. Kitty Hanson. Dr. King, late last fall, James Foreman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was reported as saying that he felt that 85% of the Negroes do not adhere to nonviolence. He said he thought that the, they were allowing the nonviolent movement to go ahead only because it was working. What is your comment? Well, I think there may be some truth in the statement that uh, the large majority of Negroes in the country do not follow the nonviolent method uh, out of a commitment to it as a creed or as a way of life. Uh, some of us are trying to be committed to it as a way of life, uh, as a creed. I would think that most Negroes who are engaged in the nonviolent struggle uh, see this as the best strategy so that it becomes a meaningful and powerful technique. Uh, many have moved from the position of seeing it as a temporary strategy uh, to a way of life, but I think it is still true that most Negroes follow the nonviolent approach because it has pragmatic value and it is working and is a practical and meaningful technique. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been said that one of the most important words today for the Negro leadership is the word militant. Uh, and you yourself in your speech in Washington uh, praised what you quoted, the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community. Now, as a leader of the nonviolent uh, philosophy, how do you reconcile these two attitudes? And do you consider yourself a militant leader? Well, I hope I'm militant. I think it is possible to be militantly nonviolent. Uh, Nonviolence can often be misunderstood, and I think this is uh, what happens when one uses the phrase passive resistance, which is a good one, but it can be a misnomer at some points, because it gives the impression that one is passive and doing nothing, wherein this is a very active method, a very powerful one, and it does resist. Uh, what we insist in the nonviolent movement is that in resisting the unjust system, and this should be done with all of one's might, but not with violence, and it should not be done with hatred. Gay Pauley. Uh, Dr. King, uh, you've called 1963 the most decisive year in the Negro's fight for equality. What do you see as the big push by the Negro this year? I think the movement will continue with the same momentum, or probably more momentum, in 64 uh, as in 1963. I think it will intensify. Now, because of the fact that this is a presidential election year, there will be a great deal of activity around uh, voter registration, increasing the number of Negro registered voters, both uh, North and South. Uh, also, because of the Civil Rights Bill uh, being debated now, 
uh, there would be a good deal of programmatic action around the Civil Rights Bill and working with determination to see that the bill goes through intact and that it is mm -hmm. not watered down. Uh, there will also be a great deal of work, I'm sure, in 1964 in the area of getting better jobs for Negroes through selective buying programs. and you mean uh, boycott? Uh, yes, I think that uh, the Negro now realizes that he has just enough buying power to make the difference between profit and loss in almost uh, any major industry. And more and more, the, the Negro will say, if you respect my dollar, then you must respect my person. And if that industry will not adopt a policy of non-discrimination, uh, then I'm sure that more and more Negro leaders will go on record endorsing uh, withdrawing economic support from that particular industry. Catherine Mackin. Dr. King, how do you justify uh, the boycott movements to achieve racial balances in uh, the large cities of the North, which is where such movements are now underway? Uh, if I can explain just one thing, a lot of people feel that integration of schools was a problem. Now we're faced with this thing of possibly putting children on buses and taking them out of their neighborhood, out of where they're supposed to be going to school. How is this justified? Well, first I would say that uh, this is a very serious social problem, uh, this problem of de facto segregation in the public schools created to a large extent by the long night of residential segregation. And to an extent, we will have this problem on our hands until we solve uh, the housing problem. On the other hand, I do not think we can afford to wait until the housing problem is solved before grappling with this very serious problem of de facto segregation. Uh, integrated education, uh, quality education is so important. Uh, the attitudes that are formed in these early days of education by children uh, can be very decisive in one's later life. And I think it is absolutely important for communities to deal with this problem in a very forthright manner, even if it means busing students to other areas. And I think the boycott is just a, a, a means of dramatizing the indignities and the injustices which go along with a segregated school system. It's a way of bringing it to the surface and creating such a crisis that the community can no longer overlook it, but it must be dealt with. In just a moment, we'll have more questions for our guest, Martin Luther King, Jr. Our guest is Martin Luther King, Jr., who has just been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for 1964. We'll have a question now from Kitty Hansen of the New York Daily News. Dr. King, one of your people, Wyatt T. Walker, has been quoted in Time magazine as saying that the moderate approach doesn't work and that the Negroes have got to have a crisis. And I've also read that you are planning demonstrations in the near future in such places as Danville, Virginia, and Williamston, North Carolina. Aren't you thus creating a crisis rather than working toward a solution? In some instances, and I think this is quite true in situations where there's hardcore resistance, uh, it is necessary to create a problem in order to get to the real solution of the problem. Uh, I think the, the meaning or the reason for uh, direct action in some situations is to create a situation so crisis-packed that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate will be forced to deal with the issue and to negotiate. I think the ultimate solution to the problem will be found in the realm of dialogue rather than monologue. But the fact is that we live in so many situations in, in the South where there is a refusal to negotiate. And even when negotiation takes place so often, it's, uh, it isn't good faith negotiation. So we feel that there are instances in which we must create a situation in a nonviolent manner. Uh, so that the community will have to deal with the problem. The uh, nonviolence always end up <laughs> with violence, or almost always, Dr. King. Um, what 
What excuse or what uh, uh, reason do you offer for, for this approach of creating a crisis atmosphere in a community which leads to bloodshed, as it has in many southern cities and some northern? Well, I think we should see the source of the bloodshed first, and uh, we must understand the real nonviolent creed. Uh, nonviolence has never said that uh, one who is engaged in a nonviolent movement will, will not face violence. It says that you must be willing to be the recipient of violence, if necessary, but never the inflictor of violence. It goes so far as saying you must be willing to die, if necessary, uh, in order to serve as a real witness for the truth as you see it. It has never contended that uh, violence may not emerge. The only contention is that uh, if violence emerges in the situation, the nonviolent resistor must absorb that violence, and through the absorption of it, he creates, uh, I mean, he arouses the conscience of the community. Well, doesn't this cri crisis atmosphere, though, uh, uh, create or endanger the Negro's cause by creating among the whites a resentment of feeling that the Negro is moving too rapidly, uh, too, uh, asking too much so suddenly? Does this worry you that this atmosphere could be created? Or is? Well, I think this is a temporary response in any social revolution. Or well, doesn't it hurt uh, your cause? I don't think so, ultimately. I think it helps it in the final analysis. The only way people can grapple with their prejudices is to admit that they have them. And so often people don't realize they have them. Uh, and so often people don't realize or honestly acknowledge that there is a problem. And uh, it is necessary in the nonviolent movement to bring the issue to the surface so that people are forced to deal with it and to deal with their conscience on the issue. Dr. King, the single greatest stronghold among the states <clears throat> in this area of integration is Mississippi. Uh, not too much progress has been made there. The schools, Old Miss is no longer uh, really integrated, although it is an accomplished fact that it was. Uh, Medgar Evers, of course, was killed there last year. Do the civil rights leaders uh, have any plans to do anything about this situation in Mississippi? Is there anything that can be done to break this down? Realism impels all of us to admit, I think, that Mississippi has such a serious problem that uh, it will take the power of the federal government using all of its constitutional authority to uh, bring the people of that state to the point of, of uh, respecting uh, the Negro and his constitutional rights. Now, there are many things that the government can do that it is not presently doing. Uh, plants uh, go up in Mississippi with federal funds, and yet these particular plants still have policies of notorious discrimination toward Negroes in employment. Uh, I think if the federal government clamped down at this point, business leaders in Mississippi would begin saying, we've got to do something about this problem because it's too costly and bad for business. Uh, so that some of these things must be done. Uh, and short of this, I really don't see a solution to the problem in Mississippi any time in the near future. In just a moment, we'll have uh, more questions for our guest, Martin Luther King. We'll be right back. A question now from Kitty Hansen for our guest, Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King, many white people, as well as Negroes, are fond of pointing out that for all their love of violence and teaching of aggression, that the black Muslims have taken the lead in urging the Negro to raise his own standards of living and morality, that drinking, sexing, and narcotics are forbidden. Uh, would you care to evaluate the black Muslims for us? Well, I would say... Uh I reject the philosophy of uh, this movement if that philosophy is one that advocates uh, a doctrine of black supremacy. Uh, I think a doctrine of black supremacy is as dangerous as a doctrine of white supremacy, and I don't feel that we should seek to substitute uh, one tyranny for another. Uh, I would also uh, reject the whole idea of racial separation as a solution to the problem rather than racial integration. Uh, on the other hand, this movement did not come into being out of uh, thin air. It is symptomatic of the deeper unrest, the discontent, and the frustration of many Negroes in this country. 
And I think that while one condemns the philosophy, it is necessary to work uh, with renewed vigor to get rid of the conditions that brought this movement into being. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King, uh, Louis Lomax, the author, the Negro author, has called the crisis in Negro leadership grave. And he cites in particular differences between you and Mr. Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. Is the leadership in, in a state of crisis? I'm not familiar with this difference. Uh, I have a very warm relationship with Mr. Wilkins, and uh, we agree on tactics in most instances, and certainly on the goals. And I think the leadership is more united in the civil rights movement now than ever before. Dr. King, it takes money and a lot of it to keep a movement like this going. What is the financial status of the civil rights organizations? Can they, are they in trouble, or can they just keep right along? Are they all right? Well, I must say that uh, over 1963, we gained a great deal of financial support from people of goodwill all over the nation. Now, this does not mean that all of our financial problems are solved. All of the organizations have very large staffs and large programs, and it does take a very large budget for each of these organizations. And if we don't continue to get this kind of support, we, we are in trouble. I think it is significant that we have gotten real support in the past. I'm afraid we uh, just don't have time for any more questions. We've come to the close of today's session.